Lauren Snell here, and welcome back to High Intensity Business, the podcast where we discuss high intensity strength training and provide you with the tools, the tactics, and the strategies to grow your strength training business. Download and read the transcript for this episode. Please go to highintensitybusiness.com, search for episode 370, and there you can find the transcript to download. Today's topic is we're going to be getting into um, Tim's position on aerobic cardio exercise, distinctions between exercise and recreation. And if we have time, we're going to move on to fat loss principles and a few other things, but we'll see where this goes. We've been known to focus on one bullet for an entire podcast and that could happen today. This is part nine of the high intensity training fundamental series. Today's guest is Tim Ryan. Tim is a master super slow instructor and owner of Strong Life Personal Training in Barrington, Illinois. You can contact Tim to learn all about his services to studio owners and personal trainers, including workshops, mentoring, and seminars, by going to his website, stronglifetraining.com, or emailing Tim to info at stronglifetraining.com. Tim, welcome back to the podcast. Well, hello, Lawrence. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. It's good to see you again. I'm always yeah. appreciate you getting up really early, and I, you know, <laughs> it's a nice, nice kind of early afternoon, easy time for me. So I'm very grateful. And uh, let's let's kick off with this your position on aerobic and cardio exercise, shall we? And and get into this. We touched on it a tiny bit, obviously, in terms of I think we talked about cardiovascular fitness benefits and and maybe touching it in some other ways during this series. It's been a long series, so I've forgotten. Um, yeah. But yeah, where do you want to start with this one? Okay, so yeah, I really have been waiting to kind of address this issue because um, there's been a you know historically a lot of confusion, a lot of misconceptions surrounding this, and particularly even some controversy between the sort of high intensity philosophy uh, and you know particularly the original Nautilus philosophy and principles you know relative to this cardiovascular conditioning, cardiovascular benefit sort of thing. So um, I think it, it, it really behooves us to kind of address this issue and, and clarify some points and, and really kind of lay this out. So um, I think the best place to start would be to uh, just kind of review a little bit of history here and, um, and then kind of bring us up to the present and talk about some of the, you know, kind of physiology behind some of this. And I think we can trace uh, back to, um, you know, there became this fixation and this obsession with so-called aerobic exercise uh, over the years. And even to a strong degree today, you know, you walk into any health club, fitness center type of place and, you know, there's rows and rows and rows of treadmills and stair climbing machines and bikes and rowers and, you know, all of this so-called cardio, you know, exercise equipment. And, you know, pe people will be swarming on this and spending all their time on this while half the strength equipment sits empty, you know. Um, so, you know, people to this day still have this obsession with aerobic exercise. And part of it is kind of stems from the belief that doing this type of exercise is going to magically burn off your fat and uh, reduce your weight and, and so forth like that. And that's something we'll address when we talk about these fat loss principles, but um, relative to, you know, cardiovascular fitness or cardiovascular health benefits, you know, the belief that doing these activities are going to make your heart healthier or, you know, uh, heart attack proof your body or some sort of thing. And this, this kind of concept got started originally uh, back in 1968. There was a, a, a medical doctor named uh, Kenneth Cooper he wrote a book called aerobics, okay? And aerobics is a term that he, he coined. Um, there's a, you know, a medical physiological term called aerobic, uh, but he added the S on the end, aerobics. And in this, he, he promoted his concept of what he believed was the ultimate, you know, form of exercise. Uh, doing exercise that elevated your heart rate and uh, worked your body in this aerobic 
aerobic zone, this aerobic uh, energy pathway type of thing. And that by doing this uh, aerobic exercise, or again, what he called aerobics, uh, that you would, you know, bestow on yourself all of these, these health benefits and these heart cardiovascular, cardiorespiratory benefits, and just uh, uh, make yourself super healthy and prevent heart attacks, prevent coronary uh, artery disease and, and things of this nature. And, and he, you know, heavily promoted this and his, his uh, exercise of choice or activity of choice would be running. Okay. So he was a, a, a big time runner um, and uh, he promoted this concept of running for health and exercise. And he is really the man responsible for creating the running craze, um, not only in the United States, but you know, all over the world. And in the late sixties, after his book came out and throughout the seventies, and even to some degree today, uh, you know, he started a, a, a running boom, uh, just a, a craze with, with running and, uh, and uh, doing that type of exercise. And with, with that, you know, when he originally wrote his book, not only did he obsessively promote this concept of running and other aerobic exercise, but he believed that that was the only type of exercise you needed. And, you know, he specifically in his book got into very negatively treating strength training and uh, treating strength training as if it was virtually worthless um, other than for vanity's sake. And, you know, there's there's quotes in his book where he literally states that there's no value to strength training other than va vanity purposes. If you want to, you know, bulk up your muscles and look like a bodybuilder or something like that. But he didn't even at the time, he didn't even believe that there was any health or, you know, overall fitness benefit to uh, weightlifting or strength training. And he just, you know, exclusively promoted this concept of aerobic exercise. Um, and, you know, the idea here was that you would do this long duration, uh, moderate intensity uh, exercise, keeping your heart rate in the so-called, you know, target heart rate zone of 60 to 80 percent of your maximal heart rate and work in this zone and uh, stay within the aerobic energy pathway and so forth. And that uh, basically the more of this type of exercise, the better, you know, if uh, literally believing and promoting that the more of this type of exercise you do, the healthier you will become and the fitter you will become. And uh, um, really just instilled this concept in, in the public that, that this was the be all end all exercise. Okay. And um, as I said, it, it started a pretty big craze that exists even to this day that people believe that aerobic exercise is just this hugely healthy, beneficial activity and uh, bestows all these magical how does, benefits. How does one, obviously a lot of us in here know this story quite well. And we also know that, and maybe you're getting to this, that he did a complete 180 and changed his mind about a lot of this stuff and uh, yeah. kind of owned up to some of the damage he'd done to America's knees um, <laughs> and, yeah. and probably the, the wider uh, global population's knees. Um but how does one man and one concept aerobics, I didn't realize he just stuck an S on the end. That's funny. Um, uh, you know, and okay, he's a doctor, he's got some authority, he writes a book. How does that do trigger this? I mean, I'm always thinking about, you know, body by science had a pretty big impact, but not the impact that this has had. Right. So it's yeah. always a bit unusual. Why do you think that is? Yeah. I mean, it's really, it, it is Low really, to entry, strange, maybe. I, I guess it's just, you know, at different points in history and in our culture and society. And, you know, there's comes along things that just uh, for whatever reason, you know, just become extremely popular and extremely ingra ingrained in, in people's minds. And I, I think for whatever reason, he just uh, kind of struck a chord with people and, and kind of became successful with this and people bought into the concept and, and so forth. And I, I don't know how to explain it, but it, yeah, sure. you know, it obviously at the time became a very popular concept and started everybody off on this path. And, 
you know, you were right. I mean, he kind of funny. You mentioned the thing about the knees. I mean, he he uh, people start to, you know, over the years, people started to refer to him that, you know, something to the effect of the man that saved everybody's hearts. And, uh, you know, in contrast, Ken Hutchins said that uh, actually he's the man that destroyed everybody's knees, <laughs> you know. As Ken has this, said, I didn't know that. <laughs> with, with the running craze. Um, but, um, yeah, it's it's really kind of hard to explain and also frustrating when you, as you pointed out, you know, whether it's Body by Science or other people that promoted you know, wrote books or promoted concepts that were eminently more beneficial and important, and then they don't become as uh, popular in society. So it, it's hard to explain. But um, yeah, and you were right that, you know, as I pointed out, he really negatively treated strength training in that book. And over the years, you know, what what began to happen is more and more research came out and more and more knowledge came out about the benefits of strength training, he sort of slowly and grudgingly uh, started to accept the fact that strength training had benefits. And what he would do is he would, you know, start to acknowledge, like he wrote, he wrote sort of sequels to this book, and he's, he's written other books over the years. And, you know, you can see this evolution of him starting to acquiesce and starting to accept the fact that strength training had benefit. But, but he would always revert back to say, well, but aerobic exercise is the most important form of exercise, and you should focus on that primarily. And then, yeah, you can do a little bit of strength training and, and uh, you know, get the benefits of that too, but you should not neglect your aerobic, that aerobic is always the most important and that strength training is secondary, you know. Which is um, kind of where we are now for the most part, isn't it? Most people accept that they should do some kind of strength training is what I'm seeing, but they still separate that from aerobic activity. They still think you need to be doing both. Yeah. Um, yeah. You, you definitely, we're definitely in that stage, you know, yeah. where obviously strength training has come a long way and mm. there's more and more and more acknowledgement of how beneficial and, you know, I'm continually to be uh, amazed by everything that's been shown to be beneficial surrounding strength training and, and everything they can do for you. But, but yeah, people are still of this persuasion that you need to do both. And uh, people tend to still obsess with uh, the aerobic side of things. And, and I don't think that's so much because of their uh, desire to have heart health as it is their belief that they think that the aerobic exercise helps control their weight and helps them lose fat. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, so yeah. And over the years, I mean, uh, Kenneth Cooper has been proven wrong about a number of things over and over and over again. Um, and you know, it's, it's amazing that he's still revered because in essence, he, he, you go through his books and see the things that he was saying, he, he's now been proven wrong about just about everything he said in those books. And, um, you know, I, I think he's a genuine, sincere person and a, and a nice guy from all indications. And I, I don't think he intended any harm, but he he's just been wrong about almost everything. So um, just interesting. But, um, you know, a, as this big running craze took off, you know, not not long after that is when uh, Nautilus equipment came onto the scene. Um, and, you know, we talked about the impact that had on the fitness industry, but, um, specifically here, you know, when Nautilus came out, um, at the time, everybody was, you know, focusing on their, their cardio or their aerobic and, uh, doing that. And there was this belief that, you know, even though strength training was, you know, important, it, it was, it was not the most important thing, but people that were doing cardio and strength training and so forth. I mean, there was this belief that you had to do your aerobic exercise for your heart, and then you could do your strength training for your muscles, and then you should do some stretching and sort of flexibility training. And you, you know, you had to do these three different types of, of exercise and basically consume yourself with exercising hour upon hour a week that, you know, if you were 
doing five days a week of aerobic exercise for 30 to 60 minutes, and then you were doing your strength training, and then you were doing your stretching. I mean, you might spend 10 or 12 or 15 hours a week trying to fit all this exercise into your schedule. So, um, you know, when, when Arthur came along, I mean, he promoted the concept, as we discussed in earlier uh, podcasts, he promoted the concept that you did not need to do all of these different types of exercise that if you did the Nautilus program as prescribed, that you would simultaneously promote cardiovascular benefits, strength and muscle uh, benefits, and flexibility uh, benefits. And the idea was that through the high intensity Nautilus strength training, you would elevate your heart rate, you would get your heart rate into the target zone. If you continued to move quickly through your exercises, you could maintain and sustain that heart rate in your target zone throughout the duration. And essentially through the high intensity strength training, you would be satisfying all of Kenneth Cooper's criteria for heart healthy exercise, you know, elevated heart rate, target heart rate zone, duration of maintaining it in the heart rate zone and so forth, and that you could satisfy all that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, that was demonstrated quite effectively. We, we mentioned that West Point study and, and how they showed that, you know, you could get tremendous cardiovascular benefits from this high intensity strength training. And so much so that people didn't believe how much improvement you got in, in you know, in these areas. You know the, and can you just give, remind me the details of that study, maybe the name or something so I can try and link it up in the show notes. Do you know any more about yeah, it? Yeah. So, so it was just popular popularly known as the West Point study. And this was done at the West Point Military Academy and uh, Nautilus supervised the training of the military cadets and I, I think specifically the football team. And they took them through like a six or eight, eight week uh, Nautilus high intensity program mm -hmm. where they trained them you know, very intensely demonstrated that their heart rates were, were way up and elevated and sustained throughout the duration of the workout. And they monitored the changes. And at the time, they monitored the cardiovascular improvements by uh, measuring the uh, time to run a two mile uh, distance, right. two mile yeah. run, run time. Yeah. We covered this and, in a previous, didn't we? Yeah. Yeah. And, and the, the results showed that through, you know, the six or eight week program of only Nautilus training, doing no other exercise of any kind, that these uh, test subjects reduce their two mile runtime by two minutes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so just a enormous improvement in, in that runtime. And uh, I think they looked at improvements in blood pressure, resting heart rate, those kind of things. And it, all, all these benefits were were evident yeah. here, you know, so yeah. in addition to obviously like increasing their muscular strength by like 63% and you know, <laughs> things of that nature. So there's also, um, there's also, a, a, we'll try and find it and link up in the show notes as well is, a. I believe there's a meta-analysis. I think that uh, Dr. Doug McGuff was involved in, I believe Dr. James Fisher and James Steele were also involved in, and they basically looked at a whole lot of studies that were looking at um, cardiovascular fitness outcomes looking at certain enzymes that are indicative of that um from from resistance training and um steady state activity and they looked at a whole load of studies and they basically saw no significant difference in those outcomes for cardiovascular fitness improvement so yeah so there's a fair amount of literature out there to support this now um which is interesting not to say people shouldn't do it if you love doing it that's different we're talking about yeah. if you want to just get most bang for your buck out of your out of your exercise Oh, yeah. You know, in, in terms of, um, you know, as, as we've gone through history here and as the years have progressed, there has been a tremendous amount of additional research, as you just highlighted, comparing the benefits and and comparing the changes and, and so forth. And yeah, I mean, now it's it's virtually indisputable that, you know, high intensity strength training can pr produce a tremendous array of cardiovascular health and fitness benefits and that there there really is no you know advantage to to doing you know when you look at the fact that 
again, strength training can do it all. Okay. Strength training can provide you cardiovascular health benefits and cardiovascular fitness benefits. And uh, strength training can obviously produce the strength and all the other associated things and, and the flexibility and everything. And, and, and you, you know, strength training is the whole package that you can get it all from. So there is no need to, to add that aerobic exercise in addition to the strength training. I mean, you can do it if you want for, you know, recreational purposes or whatever, but um, you don't need to do it um, for your health and fitness. But, you know, one thing that I'll say, and this, this kind of touches upon some of this functional ability stuff that we talked about in the last session is that, you know, certainly if, if you are training for a, you want to run a marathon or you want to run a a 10 K race or something like that, um, you, you obviously have to train with running if you're trying to be a good runner. Okay. So there's some of that specificity of effect and that skill building and that efficiency and things that go on with helping you improve at a particular sport or athletic event. So, um, on the one hand, strength training can do it all for your overall health and fitness, but if you're planning to want to be good at a specific activity, you have to practice and train on that activity, you know? So, um, in that case, if you want to be a good runner, you have to run, you know, but, um, let me, let me throw you, throw you one curveball on this quickly. Um, so yeah, I mean, you did a great job covering the functional ability and skill acquisition stuff in the last podcast we did uh, focused on six factors of functional ability, which was amazing. And I really enjoyed that and learned so much. Um, but just one thing I want to discuss with you briefly. So I've, I've, as you might know, have discussed the differences in benefits between high intensity interval training. So cycling really hard on a bike for a short duration or sprinting uh, or something like that um, versus high intensity strength training. I've had Dr. Martin Gabala on the show a couple of times. He's probably the leading authority on high intensity interval training. Um, I talked about it with Wayne Westcott. And I've also been having conversations with a few other colleagues. And there seems to be a bit of a um, consensus around, you know, actually, if you want to optimize VO2 and maybe even dump more glycogen out of the lower body, predominantly the thighs, and also get more uh, cognitive benefit through more BDNF passing the the blood-brain barrier and stuff like that, then actually there is a place for, if you want to, we're talking about optimization now, high-intensity interval training alongside HIT. Now, obviously, most people, especially our clients, are incredibly busy. So look, they're looking for bang for buck. You know, I was having a chat with a client the other day. She said, the only problem with this training is I haven't got time to do my swimming, et cetera, et cetera. But I get more, this is more beneficial, right? And I said, yes, it is. And I said, it's a shame you can't find time to do other stuff you love, but I get it. She's a very, very successful lady and very busy. Um, and that's that's the reality of our clients, right? And that's why, you know, this is, we're not saying this is all you should do. Well, I'm not. I mean, some of us might. Uh, I'm saying this is the most effective and efficient thing you can do. So where do you stand on that, Tim? Do you think that, so that apparently that I haven't looked into it myself deeply, but apparently there is science to support that um, it maximizes VO2 through doing high intensity interval training, but more, more effectively than regular high intensity strength training. And then that, that, maximization is associated with longevity. In fact, Skylar and I were talking about this in the last podcast together uh, and he was sharing this with me. So what do you, what do you think? Do you think, Hey, if you've got the time, there's more benefit. Are you not buying it? Do you think, ah, you know what? It's probably not that important. You get all you need from your high intensity strength training sessions. What do you think? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, a couple points here. So uh, one of the things is, as you've sort of started to allude to is that the, the research has seemed to indicate that in terms of bang for your buck and improvement, cardiovascular fitness benefits and, and even health benefits, that this high intensity interval type of training is more beneficial than the long steady state yeah. kind of moderate heart rate type of thing. So um, e- even if you apply this to, let's say running, r- rather than to run for 30 consecutive minutes at your you know, in your target heart rate zone at the same pace, um, it's actually more beneficial to have those bursts of higher intensity where, again, if you're running that you may be running at a slow jog and then you spend a minute of sort of 
almost sprinting or, you know, close to it with a real high intensity, get that heart rate way up for a, a minute or two, and then back down from that and return to a slow jog for a couple of minutes and then have another burst of high intensity type of thing. And that by doing this, you can not only maximize the benefit, but you can reduce the amount of training time necessary that, you know, five or 10 minutes of this high intensity interval has been shown to be more beneficial than 30 minutes or something of steady state. Um, and the idea here is that, that the cardiovascular system benefits more from that heart rate variability, that, that increasing of the heart rate, then bringing it back down, increasing the heart rate and then bringing it back down. And those intervals that that actually conditions the cardiovascular system at, at, you know, at a more advantageous uh, level. Um, so one thing that I would point out is if you think about this, that that high intensity interval is exactly the thing that happens with our strength training, our high intensity strength training, that when you're on an exercise performing it, you obviously are really jacking that heart rate up, um, in, increasing the heart rate, increasing the breathing rate, increasing all those stresses on the cardiorespiratory system, you elevate that up for a minute or two while you're performing your exercise. And then obviously as you complete the exercise and move to the next machine, there's some coming down of that heart rate to some degree, uh, depending on how long you rest and so forth. But that heart rate then comes down, okay? You move to the next machine and now you bring that heart rate back up again. And if, if you track that over the course of the workout, yeah, you're getting that interval, that, that variability in the heart rate increasing and then coming back down and increasing, coming back down. So one thing I would say is that our form of high intensity strength training does something very similar to the cardio respiratory system as, you know, that, <clears throat> that interval training with, with the cardiovascular type exercise. So that'd be one thing. Now, in, in terms of the question, um, you know, there's no, there's no doubt that strength training is the essential core component of your exercise program. So I, I teach all my clients that st the strength training program is the foundation or is the cornerstone of your exercise program, that you should be uh, making sure that that is what, sh what you're getting accomplished and doing that you know, <clears throat> with the right amount of uh, frequency and so forth and consistency, that, that that's what's going to give you the more bane for your buck. That's what's going to give you the well-rounded benefits. And that if you do your high intensity strength training correctly, you will essentially receive all the benefits that exercise has to offer. Okay. And that that would be the critical thing to, to maintain. Now, outside of here, you are free once you've accomplished your strength training and met that requirement outside of that, you're free to do whatever you choose to do as part of your lifestyle that, you know, but that's up to you. This is where the personal um, preferences come in is that if you choose to either because you don't have time or because you just don't have any desire, if you don't want to do anything else other than your strength training, you're not going to really lack anything. You're not going to neglect anything. Um, you will have accomplished every, everything that exercise can give you. So other than that, go live your life. Um, but if you have a, a personal preference or desire that you want to, you enjoy running or you enjoy bicycling or playing tennis or racquetball or whatever activity you like to do, you know, go out and, you know, do those types of activities. Yeah. And, you know, you could gain some mental health benefits. And, you know, when you're just, healthy, let me just interject for two seconds. So sure. not to summarize you before you finish, but are you basically <laughs> saying you don't buy it is what you're kind of saying. You're saying some individuals, and I haven't looked, reviewed the science myself, so I can't really comment too much. But you but you're saying there is there is no additional benefit to high intensity interval training if one is already doing high intensity strength training. You're getting all the benefits, all that other stuff. You're not buying, you're not buying a greater improvement in VO2 max, a greater improvement in brain health, hippocampus health or size. I think it was these things. You you just think it's all being it's all being addressed in the strength training and anything else is is just, you know, um, redundant and optional. Right. 
the way you summarized it exactly the way I, I okay. would believe. I don't want to misposition you, you know, so yeah. yeah. No, I, I, that's I, word. I that definitely that that's the way I would summarize it. And, and the way I tell people this is that, um, again, if you're doing your strength training, you've accomplished everything that exercise can do for you. Okay. You're not going to be lacking anything in terms of your health or your, your general fitness. Okay. Um, I do make the caveat though, that um, if your desire is to, again, compete in marathons, 10 Ks, triathlons, you know, whatever, or, you know, some sport or, or other activity that if you're going to involve yourself in those other activities, there is a need to do some specificity of yeah. training for those types of activities, you know? So if you want to be a runner and, and do those types of events, you need to get out there and run. Okay. But here's what I tell them. Okay. By doing, by adding that running to your program, it will help you to become a better runner, a more efficient runner. Uh, it'll give you the ability to tolerate the activity of running more, you know, yeah. it'll prepare your body to tolerate that you will gain benefits associated with becoming a better runner. Okay. But the fact that you're adding that running is not going to necessarily make you more fit or more healthy than somebody that doesn't do that. Okay. In other words, um, you know, but again, by doing your strength training, you've accomplished everything that you can accomplish through, through exercise and you're not making yourself even better by adding the running. You're just improving your running skill and your running efficiency and your running ability, so to speak. And that's a benefit for the particular sport or activity, but it's not giving you some kind of magical benefit that somebody sure. that doesn't run isn't going to achieve. Yeah, you know? I understand what you're saying, but I guess if we just look at this through the lens of optimal health and there's no time issue right because we're always thinking about time and busy professional clients um you know if 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 the the claim that one can improve their vo2 max more effectively or uh, or maximize it with the addition of high intensity interval training and that was to be clearly shown in the science tim i'm assuming you would be prepared to change your mind on that but you don't buy it right now well yeah what it sounds like no, I, I would be pre prepared to change my mind. But one of the things that, that I would say is that, um, you know, number one, as, as Dr. McGuff has pointed out, there is some a lot of questions about this whole VO2 max and, and its validity, mm -hmm. um, vo both from the sort of the con concept of how the test is conducted and what the test was originally designed to measure. It, it was never designed to measure something at activity. It was more a test to measure something that occurs at rest. Um, but here's a, another interesting point is when they've um, looked at VO2 max, there's been studies done where they've uh, trained people, well, where they've measured VO2 max, but they've kind of um, done it in such a way, like let's say they, they use a bicycle ergometer and they measure somebody's uh, VO2 max, and then they proceed to train them, but they train only one leg. Yeah. Okay, so they, they let's say you pedal the bike with only the right leg, and you don't train your left leg or, you know, something like that. And what they find is that when they go back and they do the test, um, when they test the leg that was trained, they show an increase in VO2 max. When they test the untrained leg, there's no change in VO2 max, yeah. okay? So one thing that that illustrates is that this VO2 max is not a systemic uh, change. That's yeah, local, that yeah. it, it, It's a localized muscular adaptation. Mm -hmm. And the adaptations occur, obviously, in the muscles that are trained. So what's going on here, in, in fact, there was a... Uh, he's no longer living, but there was a guy, uh, again, another medical doctor named George Sheehan, who was known as the running guru, and he was a big proponent of running. But even he said that, um, you know, people assume that the cardiovascular aerobic type benefits are occurring in the heart and lungs. Yeah. But he said there is no proven benefit to the heart and lungs that actually all the benefits are, rec are occurring in the peripheral muscle cells. Okay. And that what's 
your, your improved performance and your improved VO2 max is occurring because the muscles are becoming more efficient at extracting and utilizing oxygen. Okay, it's not that your heart's getting better or your lungs are getting better. Um, what's happening is the muscles are getting better at extracting and using oxygen. So your VO2 increases because the muscles are becoming more efficient at doing that. Yeah. Um, and it's the studies that I just mentioned actually reinforce that, that you're only getting VO2 max benefits in the muscles that were trained because the adaptations are within the muscles, not within you know the heart and lungs type of thing. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that would be one thing that I would point out. Um, and <clears throat> you know, again, if you, if you're getting all the overall benefits through something like strength training, add, adding to it and going to do some running, you, you may, you know, add some benefits again to your skill and your efficiency of running, but I don't think you're giving yourself any additional health benefit Butter. or yeah. something like that. Um, you know, so I think we just have to keep in mind, and this is where people get confused. It's that there is a specificity of training effect that if you, if you practice your running, you're going to make the, the leg muscles and the muscles associated with running more efficient and help them more efficiently utilize oxygen. And that's going to help you for that specific activity, but that's not necessarily bestowing some kind of magical health benefit or, you know, heart protective uh, effect yeah. that you're, you're not what, getting. What about this one then? What about this one? Then? What about the, the, the I mean, there's a, I believe there's a study and I should be a little bit more prepared. I know, but um, that shows that greater glycogen, was depleted out of the thighs through, I believe it was maybe the carrow bike or some kind of like cycling protocol versus a leg press. And mm -hmm. we know that, you know, the more glycogen you deplete out of the thighs, the more insulin sensitive you're going to be and the probably the, the more metabolic benefits you're going to receive. So that's interesting. Yeah. I mean, obviously you can question study designs and how they did that. Yeah, and the protocols, I, I, but. I'm not at all familiar with that okay. study, you know, haven't looked at it. Um, my initial reaction, you know, would be it, you know, hard for me to imagine that because uh, obviously like a set of leg presses, particularly done in a high intensity fashion to moment, momentary failure, you know, that that's an extremely depleting, you know, exercise. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, maybe, maybe one of the reasons if it's true, if the study design is correct, and if it's true that the the Carol bike, you know, depletes, depletes the glycogen even more, it would probably be just from a matter of being, um, of a longer duration and, you know, burning more overall energy due to the longer duration of it versus, you know, maybe the minute and a half or whatever that you spend on, on the leg press. Um, so there could be some benefit there. Um, yeah. but you know, I, I would, I would have to look at that and see also with, with the overall, I mean, because we know that strength training is offers tremendous improvement in your overall insulin sensitivity too. So mm -hmm. again, you'd have to kind of look at um, sort of the net effect on overall full body insulin sensitivity and control of blood sugar levels and things like that. And not just the localized event of which exercise depletes your glycogen more, you know, but it, it's hard for me to speak to that. Cause I, I haven't looked at that study or something, but uh, yeah. 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 Okay. Fair enough. Fair so, enough. Um, All right. But um, you know, one of the things I wanted to kind of uh, address is that, uh, you know, when, when Nautilus came out and, was promoting this idea of getting all these simultaneous benefits and keeping your heart rate elevated and, and sort of satisfying all the criteria for cardiovascular exercise. One of the pushbacks on that was that, um, well, yes, uh, Nautilus training can elevate your heart rate and Nautilus training can keep your heart rate elevated in the target zone and it can maintain it for you know, the, the appropriate duration. And on the surface, it can satisfy all those, those criteria. But um, when you do your high intensity strength training, you're not working aerobically, you're working anaerobically. Okay. So therefore you're, you're not doing, you know, aerobic training and not deriving the benefits in the same way you would as if, if you did aerobic training. 
Okay. Well, here, here's an important point that a lot of people miss. When we talk about this word aerobic and anaerobic, okay, people have associated that with aerobic being heart healthy, let's say, and anaerobic being something that's for your muscles. Okay. So, you know, we think of it in a way that, well, if you're doing aerobic exercise, you're benefiting your heart. And if you are doing anaerobic exercise, you're benefiting your muscles. Okay. Um, well, let's take a step back. What, what does aerobic and anaerobic mean? Okay. Aerobic means with oxygen and anaerobic means without oxygen. All right. But more specifically, what these terms are referring to is is not the part of the body that you're working or not something that's benefiting your heart versus your muscles, but rather it's referring to energy metabolism. Okay. It's referring to the, how are the muscles receiving the energy to perform the work they're doing? All right. Um, it's got nothing to do with your heart or your lungs or your muscles per se. It's strictly how are the muscles receiving energy? by what processes, by what metabolic pathways are your muscles receiving energy? Okay. So when you're applying the word aerobic, it means the muscles are receiving energy through pathways that utilize oxygen to process the energy. And anaerobically, it's receiving energy by pathways that don't rely on oxygen to process the energy. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, so it just merely pertains to how the muscles are deriving that energy. It's not applying to something that's heart healthy or muscle healthy. Okay. So it's irrelevant, really, as far as your heart is concerned, it's irrelevant whether you're working aerobically or anaerobically, that that's not going to distinguish what's health, heart healthy or what's not. So one of the big misconceptions and misapplication of this is that somehow, uh, doing exercises that allow your body to receive energy through the aerobic pathway is somehow magically beneficial for your heart and cardiorespiratory system. And doing something anaerobic is, is not going to be heart healthy or something. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I would push back and say, well, you know, with this Nautilus training, or whatever, not being aerobic, who cares? Okay. There, there's been nothing that's ever been shown that, uh, doing exercises in the aerobic pathway versus the anaerobic is somehow more beneficial for your, for your heart and lungs. And we've been, you know, shown over the years as some of these research studies that we've been referring to is that, you know, strength training, even though it's so-called anaerobic, it's hugely beneficial for your, your heart and your cardiorespiratory system and all the benefits associated with that. Um, so um, it, it really doesn't matter you know, from, from that standpoint, how those muscles are receiving their energy. So, um, you know, but people have this ingrained in their head that aerobic is heart healthy and anaerobic is somehow yeah. not benefiting your heart. Okay. Um, so I, I think from that standpoint, Kenneth Cooper's entire concept of focusing on doing exercises that work in the aerobic pathway is irrelevant. You know, there's been no, no indication that that's somehow kind of magically, beneficial for your heart and that anaerobic is not beneficial or, or something. Um, so um, it, it really doesn't matter from that regard. Um, it's just simply your, your heart and lungs don't know or care what activity you're doing. Okay. Whether you're leg pressing, whether you're running, whether you're bicycling, all the heart and lungs know is that the muscles are performing work the muscles demands for energy and blood and oxygen and all this kind of stuff are increased and that the body is going to respond to deliver those things to the working muscles. So I've always pointed out to people that the muscles are what's driving everything else that's occurring. Okay. The work that the muscles are performing is what's driving everything else. So the muscles are the master. Okay. So to speak, and that, the rest of the body is sort of the slave to what the muscles need, all right? So the heart and lungs are becoming involved in the exercise because the muscles are demanding things that the heart and lungs need to supply for those muscles to do that work. So the focus, and 
uh, you know, we always used to say, well, and still do, that the muscles are the window to the body. And what that means is that all of the benefits of exercise occur by virtue of the muscles being the key driver of everything else that goes on physiologically in the body, that muscular work is the key to exercise. And that when the muscles perform work, the rest of the body responds to delivering what those muscles need to sustain that work. So the heart and lungs are only being involved in the exercise because the, the muscles are demanding that of them. Okay. Um, so the muscles are driving that. And, you know, it's not as if when you go out running that you're sending your heart out for a run. <laughs> okay. Um, the heart can't do any work on its own. Okay. What's happening is you're working your muscles. Okay. And you're increasing the demands on your muscles. And that is by, in, in turn, increasing the demands on your heart and lungs. So we've always said that the more you stimulate the muscles or the more productive or effective the exercise is for your muscles, automatically, the more effective that exercise is for engaging all the other systems of the body, whether it's the heart and yeah. lungs or stimulating the bones or stimulating your overall metabolism and, you know, the different responses uh, that go on is that the muscles are driving it all. And the key to effective exercise is to find a way to make the exercise uh, more stimulatory to the muscles. And then by virtue of that, you're automatically engaging the other things at the most effective level. And, you know, with that in mind, I, I'd like to offer my most favorite quote from Arthur Jones that I think he made this statement in the mid to late 1970s, but this is just, uh, you know, I'll, I'll read it to you here. Um, Arthur was being interviewed on a, a, a medical kind of talk show type of thing and being interviewed by a doctor. And Arthur just let loose with this idea, like the doctor asked him, like, well, I just don't understand how could Nautilus training be heart healthier? How could Nautilus training improve your cardiovascular system? And Arthur just unleashed on this guy. And, and uh, Arthur said, quote, the lifting of weights is so much superior for the purpose of improving the cardiovascular condition of the human being that whatever is in second place is not even in the running, no pun intended. That is to say, <laughs> running is a very poor, a very dangerous, a very slow, a very inefficient, a very non-productive method for eventually producing a very limited, low order of cardiovascular benefit. Any, any result that can be produced by any amount of running can be duplicated and surpassed by the proper use of weightlifting for cardiovascular benefits. Now, I realize that there are hundreds of thousands, perhaps millions of people in this country who don't understand that, who don't believe that, who will not admit that. Now, these people are simply uninformed. Certainly, it's possible to run with no benefit. It's possible to lift weights with no benefit. I'm talking about the proper use of weightlifting and properly applied weightlifting will improve your cardiovascular benefit to a degree that is impossible to attain with any amount of running. Love it. Unquote. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> you know, this, this was offer. just, a, a, and to, to kind of see Arthur actually, you know, make the statement and his, you know, booming gravelly voice and his, you know, emphasis, <laughs> Condescending on the, tone. <laughs> point, just, you know, he, he kind of left this doctor sitting there in shock, <laughs> you know, yeah, um, yeah. somewhere out there, there's a video that you could find probably on the internet, but, but anyway, you know, when you think of that quote and the things that he said, I mean, he really encompasses um, and, and hits at the heart of this and kind of going to what I just said is that the key to this is that the more effective the exercise is to the muscles, automatically, the more effective it is to the heart and the lungs and the, you know, the cardiovascular effect, because the muscles are driving it. So, you know, the, the thing is, is that doing running or these things that people do for cardiovascular exercise, they're really just inferior muscular stimulating exercises. They're using the muscles to a degree that can elevate the heart rate and elevate the breathing rate. 
but they're not putting the degree of stress and stimulation on the muscles that something like high intensity strength training does. So um, our, our focus or our position would be is that anything that makes the, the muscular work better or more intense or more stimulatory to the muscles automatically makes uh, the exercise better for everything in the body that serves the muscles. Okay. So, so really effective muscular exercise is the key to all the benefits associated with exercise. So th the more you do to make that exercise more effective of a higher quality, more stimulatory for the muscles, you're automatically stimulating everything else. Because again, the muscles are the window to the body. So you've got to get at the muscles, you've got to find the way to make the, the exercise quality for the muscles as, as right. high as possible. So Tim, awesome. Well said, really appreciate the, I like the bit of, you know, debate we had there. I think it's, it serves to actually um, give you kind of a platform to talk about, you know, how the, the cardiovascular system is involved in, in strength training, which you did really well. Um, again, if anyone is interested in talking to Tim as it relates to his services to studio owners and personal trainers, he's got a lot of knowledge. He can help you with workshops, mentoring and seminars for your team. And you can contact Tim over on his website, stronglifetraining.com or email him direct info at stronglifetraining.com. Tim, thanks again. It's been an awesome podcast. And, uh, I say we got a. We just did one point today. I say we got one or two more, and we'll be done on this particular series. And for everyone listening to find the blog post for this episode and download the PDF transcript, please go to highintensitybusiness.com and search for episode three hundred and seventy. And until next time, thank you very much for listening. Mm -hmm.